Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you so much. The uh, school board chair came up and he was very nice and eloquent about the power of education, the need for families and communities to collaborate and provide a synergistic approach to educating our young people today. I'm going to seek your permission here and now to be real with you from a perspective that our children are now confused in our community and in our society. Let's give him a round of applause for being here today. As I travel the country, it is amazing to me that the primary solution to society ills is education. There is power in education. And in large part, people are complaining that they cannot get parents to be involved. They need to come to Charleston, South Carolina to see how parents are involved. This auditorium is packed today, but we should have parents standing around the walls. When I say check, you say check. Check? Check. So the message today, I'm seeking your permission to be real. You've given me that permission? Yes. So permission has been granted? Yes. Check? Check. I, I tell you, I've been doing this for 31 years. I stepped into my first inner city classroom in August of 1980 after coming to the conclusion that my dreams and aspirations of being an NBA basketball player would not suffice. <laughs> I was an All-American basketball player and had 175 scholarship offers to colleges and universities. I chose Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia, where I played four years, did very well, and was 48 hours away from signing a $1.2 million NBA contract. On a Friday afternoon, the contract was tendered. Saturday morning in New York City, West 4th Street in the village, I popped my Achilles tendon. Oh. NBA draft in Madison Square Garden was Monday morning. I was an All-American basketball player and did not get drafted into the NBA. Mm -hmm. Tuesday afternoon, my mother, 52 years old, was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So God didn't give me time to sew. Mm -hmm. I had to step up. I had to step up and I had to step out. Fortunately, I had some phenomenal teachers. One in particular in the sixth grade thought I was smarter than I was, so I was. Jeff? Yeah. She used to come by my desk every day and whisper in my ear, you're so smart. By Wednesday, I would say, what you say? I can't hear you. Say it a little loud. <laughs> she said, you're so smart. Because she wanted to see, she wanted me to see myself not as a basketball player, but as a smart individual from an academic standpoint. Let me have my dear friend Tristan come up here for a second. I see that he is awake now. <laughs> Tristan, I want to do something. I want to give you something this morning. I'm going to give you a copy of my book, Do You Know Enough About Me to Teach Me? Check? Check. Yeah. So I'm going to sign this to you. It says, to Tristan, bring your best stuff every day. Check? Check. Yeah. And it's signed Stephen Peters. Mm -hmm. Now, prerequisite is before you sell this on eBay, read it. <laughs> all right? I know how y'all roll. All right? What you say, man? All right. Share that with your mom. <laughs> While in keeping with that, my dear wife, Angela, drove me here this morning because I started out at 6 o'clock Monday morning, and it's been every day, Charleston, Florida, Augusta, Charleston, Charleston. So the only way I got to get here this morning is the clock went off at 6 and the answer said, baby, you got to go to work. Get up. So thank you, my dear wife, Dr. Andrew. 
We had a wonderful opportunity last year to be hired by the GE Foundation, the Education Foundation, out of Stanford, Connecticut. GE has plants and businesses all over the world, seven based in major cities like New York, Connecticut, uh, Atlanta, Erie, Pennsylvania, Cincinnati, and St. Louis. They hired us to come in and lay the foundation for school cultures for African American students. They went further and gave each of those school districts $20 million, or a total of $140 million. Through those contacts, I met the daughter of one of the GE execs, who graduated from Wake Forest, now works in New York for a film company. And she said, Stephen, I want to do some of what you're doing. One of the ways that I want to reach out to the African American and Hispanic community, the minority children, I want to share with them how powerful education is. So we got together and I'm promoting her new book and it's entitled C is for College. And it's based on the elementary grades, grabbing children as young as possible and drilling them on the importance of education because education equals opportunity, opportunity equals power, and that equals security. So a parent who is sitting right here in the front, this is for you. Jeff? Yeah. Okay. Now as I give you that, you give me the commitment that you're going to sit down and you're going to read that with your children, not only once, but mm -hmm. twice, not only twice, but three times, not three times, but four, five, six times, until mm -hmm. they get it. Jeff? Okay. Yeah. All right. Now. Don't have a lot of time with you this morning, but I certainly want to cover what God has placed in my spirit to cover. That's why I asked you in the onset for your permission to be real. Jack? Yeah. And so, as I wrote this book, Do You Know Enough About Me to Teach Me, a few years ago, it became a bestseller after six months because schools and school districts and parents are seeking answers to life's complex problems and issues. And I'm here this morning to tell you that we need to simplify the complexity. Jack? Yeah. It's not strange. It's not rocket science. It's simply rest that as young as possible, we teach our children to go to school, behave while you're there, learn as much as you can, come home, study what you learn, go back the next day better than you were the day before. Check. Yeah. And then when you grow older, you understand that what you possess, the gifts, your dreams and aspirations coupled with it all, you realize that even on your worst day, you're better than most on their best day. Check. Yeah. You gotta drill it. But I tell you, when I wrote this book, it's on the heels of a personal experience. Because I grew up in South Carolina, the youngest of six children from a family with no money. Check. Yeah. But I didn't realize we were poor until I got older. <laughs> I looked back and I said, how did my parents feed six children every day? Mm -hmm. Not McDonald's, not Arby's, not Wendy's, not Burger King, but a home-cooked meal at 6 o'clock every night. Mm -hmm. Check? Yeah. And at that dinner table, after dinner, we did the dishes. Then we sat back down and we talked. How was your day? What did you learn? Do you have homework? Followed by, go get it. <laughs> my mother, Charity Peter, signed my homework every day. So when I went to school the next day, not only did my teachers know my homework was done, what else did they know? There was a caring adult in that household who valued education. Because my mother and father didn't graduate college, they wanted to assure all six of us that we would. Jack? Yeah. Because every generation, ladies and gentlemen, in our families should get better. Every generation. Every generation shouldn't continue to suffer. Every generation should get better. We should empower our young children to know that hard work equals opportunity and that they have two options. They can play now and pay later, All right. or they can pay now, play now, and pay later. Simple options. I had a young lady at a high school in Florida the other day sent me an email. She said, Mr. Peters, I chose option one. I'm going to pay now so I can play later. I stand before you today as the owner, the president, and CEO of our own company, the Peters Group. I write my own check. Check? 
I own my own time, Jack, which means I work when I want to work. My grandmother told me in Walter Park, South Carolina a long time ago, boy, it's time for you to go home. You talk too much. And I don't make $5,000 an hour talking. Jack, that's why it's important for you to understand that you need to identify as early as possible the gifts of your children. God gave me the gift to talk without a speech, to talk without a teleprompter, to stand up here and know that I am anointed by him. I am a vessel by which he operates. There you go. That's why you won't hear me stutter. You won't hear me say, ah, oh, because I'm not operating on my own power. Yes, sir. Mm. Glory to God. Glory to God for the power. <laughs> I remember doing 30 cities in 40 days before Thanksgiving. Called my father, he's 89 years old in Walter South Carolina. I wake him up every morning, I put him to bed every night. I said, Dad, good morning. He said, Son, where are you? I said, Dad, I don't even know where I am. He said, How are you? He said, I'm fine. I'm always good. You all right? I said, I'm tired, Dad. He said, Boy, listen to me. You ain't old enough to be tired. <laughs> he said, Martin Luther King Jr. was tired. Harriet Tubman was tired. Oh, I said, all right, all right. <laughs> but what was he doing? He was redirecting his son. That's he was right. putting it all in perspective. Yeah. You are not old enough to be tired. Think about what yeah. everybody did before us to give us an opportunity yeah. to be where we are today. Yeah. My spirit is soaring right now, people. Because I believe that the crowd is good this morning, but good isn't good enough. We need a great crowd. We need your cousins. So when you get home this afternoon after this, you call off your cousin and say, you should have been there this morning. You should have been there for your child. You should have been there for your children. You don't have time. You don't have time to lay in your bed while, while society is eating up our children, while our children are dying and other children are walking by them unaffected by a dead body because it's become the normal behavior in their society. A child died when I was growing up. We had crisis counselors in our school. Now there's no need for a crisis counselor because our children are immune to what they see. They're immune to what they hear. I wrote this book because in South Carolina, my oldest sister, Jennifer, was told by a 10th grade teacher that she was a good girl, but she wasn't college material. Now, I'm seeking your permission to be real because now I don't understand. The teacher that told her that wasn't a white lady, it was a black teacher. So we, we need to stop complaining about what white people do to us because we're doing a pretty good job damaging our own. My wife told me to, to hold it back. I'm not even looking at you. I'm like, all right, baby, I know you now. Two years after that conversation with that 10th grade teacher, my sister graduated first in her high school class with a 3.987 grade point average. She received a full scholarship to Spelman College in Atlanta, where four years later, she graduated first in her class. She left Spelman and went to New Jersey to attend law school at Rutgers. Three years later, she graduated first in her class. Today, she is the youngest chief judge in our home state of South Carolina, Myrtle Beach. Jack. And God has a sense of humor because her 10th grade teacher was a defendant in her courtroom last summer. I tell teachers everywhere I go, all over this world, that I guarantee you, I believe unequivocally, without a shadow of doubt, that you will see these same children again. Jack. God forbid you laying up in an old folks' home, you're 85 years old, uh-huh, and you can probably see in the, uh, a new part of these bringing you your medicine today, and it's really, really said, Ms. Green, you don't look too good. I was in your third grade class at Charleston three years in a row, remember me? <laughs> Ms. Green said, oh, Lord, Willie, oh, Lord. Willie <laughs> said, now, I got good news and bad news. Good news is I got two bottles of medicine. The bad news is when I was in your third grade class, you told me, put my head down, be quiet. You didn't teach me how to read, so I guess today you just going to have to pray you be the right. <laughs> <laughs> now you realize why I asked your permission to be with you. I wrote the book, do you know enough about me to teach me? Because 
my sister's 10th grade teacher didn't know that when she got home, there was a mother and a father who valued education. That's she right. didn't know that my grandmother would pop you upside your head. I still got knots in the back of my head right now. She said, boy, I'm talking to you. You better look me in the eye. For everybody I met, I look them right in the eye. They say, something wrong with that boy. <laughs> He said, there's something wrong with the spirit of a person who can't look you in the eye. Learn that as a little boy. Do you know enough about me to teach you? A lot of our teachers aren't aware that some of our children aren't eating dinner at night. A lot of our teacher, teachers are unaware that a young African-American male saw his mama being hit by her third boyfriend this month. A lot of our teachers aren't aware that our children are confused <laughs> as to why my mama's hair weave is done, but there's no peanut butter in the kitchen. A lot of teachers are unaware that our children are confused as to why we live where we live, but there's a car outside with $5,000 rims spinning. But we don't want to talk about the real issue. I was taught on my 18th birthday when my father tapped me on the knee and he called me outside and he said, son, happy birthday, 18 today. This is a symbolic day. And I said, why? He said, because you no longer live in my house. <laughs> See, parents, if you'll learn nothing else today, teach your children that when they turn 18, you, you might not know where they're going, but they're getting up out of here, Jack. Not only are you not putting them out, they're coming back and they're bringing their own children to live in your house. There's nothing wrong with them, there's something wrong with you for allowing that to happen. That was the best gift my father ever gave me because I knew I had to crawl. I had to climb. I walked two miles to, to work. I didn't have a car until I could buy my own car and, and afford car insurance. I worked from 8 o'clock in the morning until 12 o'clock at night because I knew I had to find a new home. Because my father told me that nobody rises to low expectations. So my expectation for you is I know you have everything that is required, everything it takes to be successful. Now I'll pay all my father's bills. Jack, he tells everybody, that boy, my Stevie, oh, that my boy. <laughs> Angela will tell you, tomorrow we'll go take groceries to his house for the week. You all right? Yeah, we'll bring them up to our house. He said, man, I, boy, you know, you, you living like a king. No, I said, daddy, I'm only starting. This isn't even scratching the surface. Jack? Yeah. Because we can't get to a point where we feel like we've arrived anywhere. That's because right. we are always a work in progress. Right. At 3 o'clock this afternoon, as tired as I am, my wife will tell you I'll be sitting in a doctoral class at South Carolina State University because we can always continue to learn. I want the highest level of education possible because I don't want to have to go look for a job. I'm going to create jobs. Jack, we need to empower our young people to believe and understand that if nobody rises to low expectations, then where are you going? There's breaking news all around us. CNN, MSNBC, CBS, Fox News. And it tells you that children today are different from when we grew up. If we went to school and got in trouble, we were half dead when we got home. The only choice we had was what switch to pick. Go get the one, boy. Get a big one. Don't get a little skinny one. Jack, and my sixth grade teacher, Miss Beaton, used to have a whole fan belt from a car on her desk. She said, Lord, let me tell you, you get in trouble in my classroom, give God your heart to give me your behind. <laughs> to make matters worse, Miss Beaton lived three doors down from my house. First day I learned to pray was in the sixth grade because she was approaching my front door. I saw her coming through the front yard. And I started going deep in scripture. She knocked on the door. My mother asked me, she said, Charity, I just came today to tell you what an awesome young man you raised. I said, hallelujah. <laughs> so when I became an inner city teacher before the first day of school, I visited the homes of all 36 of my children. I knocked on doors I shouldn't have knocked on. I went in the neighborhoods I shouldn't have gone into. But I tell you what, the first day of school, I connected with 36 young people. They knew I cared from the very first day of school. And I answered the question, do you know enough about me to teach me? No, I don't, but I'm finding out every day. Jack, I know what your fear is. I know 
what you are afraid of. I know where you live. I know who you live with. I know who cares about you. And I'm going to support you in the classroom and out. Jack? Yeah. Every teacher in America ought to teach your children like they want their children taught. There you go. So therefore, we don't need to worry about test scores or quality because we know we will never allow our biological children to fail. Jack? Yeah. So everybody else's child deserves the same quality as everybody else. National statistics says that 30% of every high school student in America, every will not graduate high school. For African American males, that statistic rises to 50%. That's one out of every two African American males not graduating high school. What are they gonna do? I'm here to tell you, my wife was telling me today, she, God put her in my life to just balance me, Chad. Because I said, now I'm the founder of the Gentlemen's Club, which is a club for African American and Hispanic males that are at risk. Statistics for 16 years have shown, we started in 1996 with 30 boys from families where nobody ever went to college. Out of the first 30 boys, we graduated 24 from college. Angela came to me about five, six years ago. She said, God clearly told me to tell you as your wife that all this money that's coming in our house, we need to start giving some of it away. I said, baby, that sounds real good, but he hadn't had that conversation with me. <laughs> so we formed the Peters Group Foundation where every year we give thousands of dollars to students that I meet through our gentlemen's club, through our ladies' club, to go to college. Check. Check. This year we're trying to connect with GE, with Bank of America, with South Carolina Bank of Trust to match us dollar for dollar. Our goal is to get a half a million dollars, $500,000, to give in scholarships to students who show the desire that I want out of my present situation. I want to be better, I want to do better. And I ask you to join us. Y'all got connections, especially people in these front rows. You hear what I'm saying? Do something. Somebody has to step up to the plate. Check? Yeah. And I said to Angela, she said, well, Stephen, you know, this ought to be mandatory everywhere where people just can't afford it. I said, well, they can afford $168 a day to feed a prisoner. They can afford $18 billion to build prisons. So why not invest in our young people now before they get to that point? Y'all didn't hear what I just said. Yes, we did. 50% will not graduate. Influences cause the problems that society faces today. There are five major influences that I highlight in my book, Do You Know Enough About Me to Teach Me? Those influences are home, school, church, peers, television. You can see in the late 1950s, home was the number one influence on every child in America, mm -hmm. followed by school and church. How could a child fail when you've got home, school, and church as the one, two, and three influences in your life? Not many of us did. I was born in 1958. What I learned here was reinforced here and reinforced here. Church every morning. My mom said, I don't care what you do Saturday night. Mm, you up Sunday morning. Check. My grandmother spent the night at her house, washed the dishes. She waited until 3 o'clock on a Tuesday night, school night, to wake me up and tell me to go in the kitchen because she found some rice in the fork. That's before Prozac came out. Check. I said, you have got to be kidding me. She said, no, I'm not kidding. She pulled up her folding chair, grabbed the newspaper, and I grabbed the fork and rewashed it. I said, let's go back to bed. She said, no, 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 baby, you got to rewash all those dishes because I didn't inspect them all. Right. So what did she teach me? Do what you're going to do right the first time so you don't have to go back and do it again. See, those were influential lessons that simplified the complexity, made it very simple. These are the things you do. These are the things you say. This is the way you act. And then I'm going to send you out to the world equipped to deal with life on life's terms. That's right. We look at this. We see in the 1980s, home is holding on with a thin thread. But in the 1990s, it's gone. Because husbands came home and said to their wives, you're not pretty no more. Mm. Wives came home to the husband and said, you crazy. I don't want to live with you no more. So then this thing came up called divorce. And now children are coming to school not knowing what's going to happen at home after school. See, when we went to school in the morning, we had security. We had stability. We had consistency. We weren't worried about whether our parents were going to be home 
after school. Our biggest concern was how we were going to get out and play before homework. That was it. We left our front doors open because nobody was going to come into our house. That's when it was okay for the village to help raise your child. Yeah. Now the village is ill. That word is in the subset of the word village. Go look. There's another word in village, and it is I-L-L, -L, ill. You don't want the village near your child today. The village is full of crack addicts. The village is, it is full of people who are sick in their own way. So we have to create new villages, as your school board chairman said. Faith-based, community agencies, schools. Children come to school seven and a half hours a day, five days a week. That's more than 35 hours a week that they spend in the school. Some of them spend more time in school than they spend with y'all. Jen? Yeah. And so we get to a point where we look at this study, we need not look much further than where I begin and where I end. Mm -hmm. Today, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, television and multimedia influence is the number one influence on all children in America, followed by peer pressure, gangs, the crips, the bloods. Why are they here? Because children got tired of adult lying and letting them down. I stood in Chicago at Richard Edwards Elementary School with two young boys at four or five o'clock in the afternoon waiting for their daddies who were supposed to pick them up on a Friday afternoon for their weekend. Mm. 3.30 came, 3.45 came, four o'clock came, 4.30 came, only for me and the principal to transport those children back to their mothers and grandmothers. We wonder why our African-American and Hispanic males are angry. We wonder why they fight if somebody steps on their sneakers. It's not about who's stepping on their sneakers. It's because they're mad at the adults in their lives who are letting them down every day, who are not providing a consistent pattern of behavior for them every day. Our children are wearing people down. They're texting at the table while you're trying to eat. They're sending tweets at 2 o'clock in the morning. They're watching uncut videos on BET, MTV, VH1 at 12 midnight on a school night. It's time for y'all to wake up. There you go. And if you are already awake, wake your cousins up when you get home today and tell them next time they need to show up. Our children are confused. They're confused as to why they live in this house with the porch falling down, but there's a hoop tea in the yard. You know why it's in the yard? Because there's no money for gas. But <laughs> well, it's for show. It's for show. I got rims. <laughs> I was in a school in LA two years ago. First question in the question and answer period from high school students. After I did my whole hour speech, tired, spirit, dream. First question, what kind of car do you drive? Mm. I was like, let's do this again. <laughs> Let me try a different approach. Because obviously, obviously you didn't hear what I said in the hour previous to this, if that's the question you asked. You can drive any kind of car you want to drive once you're educated. You can live in any kind of house you want to live in once you're educated. But I'm here today to tell you that I have more money than I can spend. That's not the issue. True success is not how much money you have, what kind of car you drive. It is how many other people are you helping become successful. Yeah. How many people are you pulling up from your society, your community, from your people? That's real success. That's sustainable success. <coughs> I put this picture up in the high school assembly in Florida Monday. And I said to the students there, the girls, oh, Lord, that Nelly. I said, what are some of Nelly's songs? Oh, it's hot in here. <laughs> and I said, you know who Nelly is. You know what his songs are. You know what his lyrics are. Let's take a test. I'll give you $100 right now if you can tell me who is the present Secretary of Education. My hundred dollars still in my pocket. <laughs> Twelve hundred high school students. They know Nelly. They know his songs. They know his lyrics. But they can't tell me for a hundred dollars who the U.S. Secretary of Education is. Focus is in the wrong place. 
Check. Yeah. If our children can learn rap songs, they can learn algebra too. If our children can learn rap songs, they can learn how to conjugate verbs. There you go. Focus is in the wrong place. School board chair hit on this this morning, but I'm not so sure that he realized how deep what he presented was. Because he was saying that these are the number of students who are not finishing school, and this is how it impacts the job. I'm telling you, this achievement gap between African American and Hispanic males and other students, there's an economic impact on the world and society. Mm -hmm. Jack? Yeah. I did the math a long time ago. When I was teaching, getting out of school at 3 o'clock and going to graduate school from 4 o'clock to 10 o'clock from Monday through Thursday, then staying up until 2 o'clock in the morning studying so I could go. pass my comps to get my master's. Yeah. I did the math a long time ago, which said the more education, the more pay. The more education, the more opportunities. Yeah. Check? Check. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you something, guys. Those of you who like girls, and I know you do, if you high school on, girls don't like broke dudes. <laughs> Check? Check. You can lift my wife's left hand up and see. It'll probably blind you all the way in the back. Girls don't like broke dudes. Jet? Jet. And I'm going to tell you something, you attract who you are. All right? If, if you hear, that's who you're going to attract. If you hear, that's who you're going to attract. So use that as motivation because you have plenty of time for that. Jet? Jet? So we look at this and we see the, the same that I said earlier. Pay now, play later. Because you hit these books, Tristan. I see you awake now, boy. I love it. Not only is he awake, he's got that hand on that brain. I see I love it. You pay now, you can play later. Now, I work Monday through Saturday this week. Ask my wife where I'll be next week. Monday through Friday. I'll be on the golf course all day. Check. That's right. I'll be on the golf course all day. And guess what? While I'm on the golf course for four hours around, my phone will be blowing up because people are buying my books online. So I don't even have to go to work to make money because that's residual income. I have six books, two are bestsellers. $5,000 a day, sure, people buying books. You've got to set yourself up. You've got to pay now so you can play later. You hit these books, that's what's going to come out of them. Tristan, oh, he's smiling now. Look at him. You hit the books, later you're going to get paid. And then you can organize your life the way you want to organize. Yeah? Yeah. We have to, as a people, get out of the comfort zone of other people paying us every two weeks. Oh, I get direct deposit every two weeks. Well, that's good. I've been there. I've done that. It feels good. But step out on faith when God says to you, I have better and bigger things for you. Step out on faith. I quit a job paying me $175,000 a year in, 19, in 2004, which was eight years ago, because God said, I want you to quit your job. I want to send you all over the world with a message. And I said, Lord, I don't know about that. He said, quit your job. I quit my job. I made $25,000 in my first week as a speaker. I said, oh, Lord, I like this. <laughs> We have to step out on faith. We have to allow God to tap into the natural gifts that he's given us. Allow him to use you. Allow him to use your children. That's why they're here. These children didn't ask to be born into this mess. These children didn't ask to be born and, and listen to you and your man argue over nothing. These children didn't ask to be born into wondering why my 14, 15 year old sister's pregnant. They didn't ask to be born into this. They deserve more. They deserve for you to be the best you you can be. <laughs> Education equals future. Education equals future. We center all of our training on a simple process. We tell principals, superintendents, teachers all over the world that it is impossible to teach this generation of learners before you first capture them. That is a connection, that is a relationship, then they need to be inspired. 
That is professionalism. That's why I tell teachers all the time, you can't show up at school looking any kind of way. When I was a principal, we took a school that was last in test scores, first in dropout rate. In three years, I was at the, at the White House with the President of the United States of America, with 24 other principals being rewarded for transforming schools. We became a national Blue Ribbon School in three years. Five public housing projects, three rival gangs in my school, 1,200 young people. We became a world-class school. Check. Yeah. Why? Because we didn't issue books on the first day of school. We didn't issue books on the second day of school. The first 48 hours, we formed relationships with our students. We developed trust with our students. So on the third day, they said to us, you can. So now, you can tell me which page to turn to. Capture, inspire, then you teach. <laughs> From theory to practice, those 30 boys that I told you about in 1996 had a rap sheet so long they could wrap around Charleston, South Carolina. That's how many times they had been suspended. First year as principal, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I called them to an auditorium like this, and they sat there. They thought they were being lined up for suspensions. And I said, son, you're not here to be suspended today. I called you to the auditorium because I'd like for you to become part of my management team. I issued five walkie-talkies, the same ones that my vice principals had to my gentlemen. See, American society called them thugs, I called them gentlemen. So from theory to practice, a new direction was formed in 1996. I called them the Gentlemen's Club. Check. We took boys who had rap sheets, boys who had been suspended over and over and over again, boys who walked like this with their pants sagging, we pulled the pants up. They were transformed, and here they are today. I look at this, and I get emotional because I know the journey for many of them. Out of the first 30 boys, 24 graduated college, I'm here today to tell you that those 24 families are no longer on welfare. They don't live in public housing anymore. You know why? Because when they went to college, their younger brothers and sisters visited them on a the college campus. And they said, wow, I like this. Wow, I want this. And they too went to college. I want to tell you that the only thing worse than being blind is having sight and no vision. The only thing worse than being blind is having sight, being able to see, but having no vision. You gotta have a vision for yourself. We took the Jones Club to Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. last year. We walk in, one of our gentlemen said, hmm, this is strange. I said, well, what's strange, young brother? He said, oh, my stuff's better than anything in here. I said, well, where's your stuff? He said, it's under my mattress at home. I said, well, why is it under your mattress? He said, because I don't show it to nobody. I said, why not? He said, I showed it to my grandma one time. She said, boy, put that mess away. You need a real job. I said, brother, I'm going to stay. I'm going to cancel my flight tomorrow. I'm going to come to your school, and I want you to bring your stuff to your school. This was last May. He brought his notebook to school. Phenomenal drawing. Naturally gifted. Never took an art class called his art coordinator for the school district, contacted the guidance counselor. Long story short, he is at Atlanta Art Institute for Graphic Design, full scholarship. <laughs> we got to have our young boys be able to look at somebody and see promise. As I guarantee you, Barack Obama's former teachers didn't know that he would become president of the United States of America. And as my wife warned me in the state of Texas, I had 6,300 people in my audience at the Austin Civic Center. And just sitting there, she goes, <laughs> and I'm like, and I said, the Rock's teachers didn't know, and I went on to say, George Bush's former teachers didn't know either, either. that he would become a two-term president of the United States of America. Then I realized I was in Texas, and that's what my wife was trying to warn me about. <laughs> Sometimes I need to listen. <laughs> Bottom line is, your children that are here today, we may have a future president of the United States of America. You're going to have 
this afternoon as one of your panelists, Bakari Sellers. I guarantee you in Denmark, South Carolina, they didn't know he would be who he is today. Check. He's rubbing shoulders with President Barack Obama, anybody else he wants to rub shoulders with. As a young man, he's here today. They're putting people in front of you. We're born and raised in South Carolina just like your children. And we can go anywhere in the world. Hmm. We can go by private jet if we want to. Jet? Jet. Yeah. Rise to the next level because it's waiting for you. We look at this and we see the shaping of a future. Through our curriculum, every young boy is taught how to tie a tie. Jack, my father taught me how to tie a tie when I was seven years old. My father grew up on 10 Nassau Street right here in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm. Burke High School. I went through his yearbooks from 1940-something, and it said 10th grade, Nathaniel Peters, best dress. 11th grade, Nathaniel Peters, best dress. 12th grade, Nathaniel Peters, best dress. Now I have to explain to my wife why I own 200 pair of shoes. It's my daddy's fault. Jack? Orangeburg Oaks in High School, Orangeburg, South Carolina, four years ago we had implemented the Gentleman's Club, first Gentleman's Club in the state of South Carolina. Four years later, this year, senior class president, African American male, valedictorian, African American male, both in our Gentleman's Club, Orangeburg Oaks in High School. San Marcos, Texas, all Hispanic, Gentleman's Club. The earlier we get them in our clubs, the better off they're going to be later. Third through fifth grade. This little Hispanic boy is looking at me and he's saying, we do not want you to go home. I was like, bro, I got to go home. <laughs> Check. Check. Angela's waiting for me at home. But I tell you what I do, because I have to leave, we're going to connect you with 50 men from your community. And they're going to watch over you until you graduate high school and go to college. Mm -hmm. You want to be a doctor? Here's the doctor. You want to be the mayor? Here's the mayor. You want to be the chief of police? Here's the chief of police. You want to be a lawyer? Here's the lawyer. You want to be the doctor? Here's the doctor. Right here, in your face. You don't have to read about them. We're going to bring them right in front of you. It's your gentlemen's club meetings weekly at your school. Check? Check. We're going to teach you how to tie ties. We're going to teach you how to meet and greet. Every year we have a conference called No Child Left Out because we don't believe in No Child Left Behind. That assumes that at, at, at some juncture, every child begins in the, the same starting line. Our children are left behind when they leave the hospital. They're left behind when they can't recognize sounds and shapes in kindergarten. Our children are left behind when they're four levels reading behind normal students. We believe in No Child Left Out. Every year we host a conference right in our home state of South Carolina. We put money back into our state. Jack, people from everywhere, Canada, will be at our conference February 2nd through the 5th in Wild Dunes, Isle Palms. We bring students in from schools that we have. Buford School District has 15 gentlemen and ladies clubs. They get it. Jack, I suggest Charleston follow suit the right way. Jack? You got something that's working and proven over 16 years that 84% of the participants go to college and finish. What you waiting for? Is it money? I don't want to hear. You pay other people, so pay us. Check? Check. We look at this and we see the tie time, collaboration. We teach them table etiquette next through our curriculum. And after they learn table etiquette, they go to a five-star restaurant culminate their learning. Check? They go to art galleries and museums in, in New York, their Harlem Dance Theater. Check? Museums, plays, the orchestra. We even had them at my country club in Orangeburg to learn golf. You should have seen the members at the country club. Where did they come from? One boy said, they didn't even speak. And I said, that did, that's even more fun. You go up to them, look them in the eyes, shake your hand, say, my name is Jack. Because yeah. one guy said, I didn't even know this was back here. I said, brother, it's designed for you not to know. Yeah. Now we have them eating at the country club, learning golf at the country club, exposing them to the better life. Los Angeles, California, this was my first all-Hispanic gentleman's club. You can see in their poor little school, they didn't even have room for the teacher to teach them table etiquette. 
We made sure after they learned, they went to a five-star restaurant in LA. Jack? Jack. Mm. Our children are now raising their hands. Our African-American males are confident enough to go in the classroom and say, I don't know if my answer is right, but I'm going to try this. Here's my hand. Jack, I have the confidence to raise my hand. Even if my answer is not right, I'll come back the next time. Jack? Jack. They're going up to the board because nobody rises to low expectations. The principal sent us this picture and said, these are the boys that I suspended over and over last year. Now they're in the gentleman's club and look at them now. Look at us now. Not only are they smiling, she's smiling too. Unbelievable. When we can get young people to feel in their spirit a sense of joy and happiness, it restores hope to those who have lost hope. We need to give our children today, here in Charleston, a license to dream. When they go to bed at night, they ought to be able to close their eyes, shield out all the issues, all the noise. We need to teach them how to filter the noise, the argument, the gunshots, the, the verbiage of people telling them, you, you just like your daddy. That's worse than a nine millimeter to a child. Don't ever utter that to your child, especially your boys. Jack? Yeah. Mothers, and I know I'm not talking to you, but I'm talking to your cousin, Keisha and Tatanisha. Jack? <laughs> you can call them when you get home. Y'all need to watch how you bring men in front of your son. Y'all <laughs> yeah. give me permission to be real. i Watch it. You want to do what you do, do it discreetly. Because they pay attention, and not only do they pay attention, it follows them in their marriages, in their relationships. They see women as objects, not as human beings. We need to teach our young boys to be gentlemen, to open doors for women, to respect women. Jack, I tell my wife every morning when I wake up, I am the most blessed man, I don't believe in luck, I'm the most blessed man in the world that God gave me an opportunity to be loved by her and to love her. Respect, honor, check. check. My wife failed tenth grade. The, it failed science in the tenth grade. Got a PhD in biochemistry. Twenty nine years old. Check. Became the national professor of the year for HBCUs in two thousand four. The only woman and the minority in two thousand five to be the governor's professor of the year. Check. check. Unbelievable. You know why? Because nobody rises to low expectations. There were high expectations for her, so she rose to them every day. Continues to do it now. At our conference, Buford, South Carolina, gentlemen coming from there. You see a goal level. Gangs have different color handkerchiefs. Our gentlemen have different color ties. We start with blue, entry. We go to gold, and then you saw the premium club from Chicago with the power red. Jack? So if they're going to strive for something, let it not be gang handkerchiefs, let it be a tie to go with a white shirt. Yes. Detroit, Michigan, a group of African American males who ran the school, ran two principals out of the school, became members of the gentlemen's club, and they said to the principal, we're now part of your management team. So when we go to high school next year, there are boys who want to be in the club. So we have an idea. She said, what's your idea? Let us interview them and give you a list of 25 boys that we suggest for next year. So what you see is the president of the Gentlemen's Club in Detroit, Michigan, greeting a prospective candidate for next year to help the principal run the school. Jack. So he gets seated. This is his interview panel at a middle school in Detroit, Michigan where they are ready to pose the questions to students. Principal called my wife, my wife called me, he said, Stephen, we got a problem in Detroit. What's the problem? We got boys bringing shirts and ties in their book bags to school, going in the bathroom, putting shirts and ties on, and they're not in our official certified gentleman's club. I said to my wife and the principal, that's a good problem to have. No. Jeff, yeah. you've got an African-American male who wants to put on a shirt and tie. I said, let's just expand the club. Well, we don't have any money. Well, our foundation will support it till you put it in your budget for the next year. Jeff, yeah. money should never be a problem where we stop, put the brakes on, put the emergency brake on our African-American Hispanic male population from achievement. 
Check? Check. Release your emergency break. Release your funds. Stop putting money in the prisons and put, put it in the education. Stop putting money in prisons and put it in the education. This is also Buford High, one of the Buford High Schools, where we have 15 gentlemen and ladies clubs, where they are phenomenal in their activities, their academic achievement, attendance is up double digits, behavior, office referrals, suspensions in school and out of school are down double digits, and academic achievement is up two letter grades. Richmond, Virginia, induction. Cleveland, Ohio, which is probably two years ago the highlight of my career because they got plastered the front, the front page of the newspaper. These three Hispanic males I've been working with since they were in the sixth grade, they're now high school seniors. They signed a pact that they wanted to go to the U.S. Naval Academy when they were in the sixth grade. We work with their counselors, we work with their teachers, we work through the data. They got early acceptance into the U.S. Naval Academy this year. And in Cleveland, when LeBron was there, he saw the newspaper article. They contacted our office. What can we do? I said, well, you can provide tickets, and I'll provide them as it's civil. Six weeks, you got to come to school every day. Six weeks, you can't get in any trouble. Six weeks, you have to be passing all your classes, and you get a ticket to LeBron's game. You beat them after the game. Six weeks out of 400 tickets, first allotment. We issued 378 tickets. That means that 378 African American males came to school every day. They stayed out of trouble and they passed all their classes. Not only did LeBron give us free tickets, he had private VIP boxes for my boys. And they fed them every five minutes. This little boy said, This be the best day of my life. <laughs> Check. So it goes further because the clubs connect the community to the school. Limousine owner in the area of the school says, I read the article in the newspaper. Now, it's all splashed in the newspaper because I was featured on the Oprah Winfrey Show for this work. Our segment was selected as Oprah's top ten segment of that year. Next day, a lady calls from Chicago. She says, are you the Stephen Peters? I saw Oprah yesterday. I, 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 you never know how to respond because this is people crazy. I was like, I don't know why you want to know, Jack. <laughs> that lady said that's a certified check for $25,000. She said, that's more where that comes from because my husband and I want you to bring a club to Chicago, which we have done. And she said, the way I see this, the more work you do with them, the way you're doing it, I don't have to worry about them breaking in my house. <laughs> So people are ready to support the cause. Limousine service driver says, I want to be a part of it too. Let me drive your boys in my limousines to the game. <laughs> Didn't charge us a dime. Restaurant owners, if you put in the paper that I'm part of the business, school business partnership, they can eat at my restaurant for free. We coming. Let me train them first. Check. <laughs> boy said, no, we want to go now. I said, no, you need to know why you have three fogs versus one. Check. This is full of different colleges. Um, one was such as Columbia University in New York. Um, I've gotten a couple from Vanderbilt. Um, I've gotten some from uh, Swarthmore. And I'm like, all these colleges are actually located out, per se. And a lot of them actually wanted to actually come visit the campuses because um, I've actually been doing it like a young recruit, and they've actually seen like a lot of success what I've been doing in my early stages of high school. And I see my future is in the future. Well, actually, my goal is in the future is actually to attend Harvard, Yale, and Princeton University. Um, I've always wanted to go to Harvard since I've been about 10 years old. That's actually been my biggest dream of mine. And I plan on majoring in political science and also international business. Um, political science is a field that I've actually loved doing, and I've been doing a lot of work towards that. I um, do some shouting within the state house and the state capitol here, and I work with a lot of uh, different representatives. I do volunteer work, but political science is a big field I've been looking at, and also international business. So Marvin is a student at OW. I met him when my wife and I said to the high school principal, we'd like to host every child in your high school that has straight A's. Take them to the country club, pay for the bus to bring them there, have lunch. Marvin was one of the students who had straight A's. He tells his principal, that man and his wife that did that nice gesture for us, I'd like to spend some time with that man. Can you arrange it? Principal calls me, when are you in town? Would you please do me a favor? And I said, what? He said, stop by and sit and talk with one of the males that you met the other day. I said, was it Marvin? And he said, yeah. I said, I'd be glad to. Came by, the principal leaves, Marvin and I in the principal's office, and I said, Marvin, what's your story? 
tells me that his mother died when he was one. Can we do some, get some feedback off the mic, please? His mother died when he was one. He's being raised by his father, he's a single parent, and his grandmother. They live in a one-bedroom apartment. Ladies and gentlemen, Marvin has a 4.5 grade point average. 4.5. He was working at the pharmacy, and this is how God works. There are no coincidences in life. He requests my presence at his school. I meet him. I find out he works at the pharmacy after school around the corner from my office downtown, Orange Park. I say to him, how much are you making at the pharmacy? He tells me. I said, I'll double your salary. You come work in my office. Marvin now works for Peter's group. Jack? He says to me, there's a program at Yale University next summer called Leader One. It's nine weeks. Our foundation, my wife, helped form her father before he died. But we provide scholarships to first-generation college attendees. We'll pay for him to go to Yale University next summer to this Leader One program. And then his entry into Harvard is secret. Hmm. Jack. Yeah. <laughs> how you change society one student at a time I said what's your what, what motivates you he said I don't want to be poor anymore so I'm going to attain the highest level of education possible which means my options are there somebody in Florida the other day asked me well brother what keeps you motivated I said man you know what I remember Walter Bar 329 Springwood Drive we used to have to open the oven in the kitchen to the stove to get heat, to get dressed for school. I don't need motivation, Jack. I'm not going back to where I came from. That's right. And I want to bring as many of you and your children with us, Jack. They need to be empowered to understand that whatever they dream, they can be. They need to, to be empowered to understand that it will take hard work, and they need to choose option one. Option one is pay now, play later. Option two now is play now, pay later. Jack, see, your cousins choose an option two. That's why they're not here today. I can't believe you got up early on a Saturday morning and go sit in the auditorium. <laughs> they're going to be living the way they're living, and every generation behind them won't get back. Jack, yeah. my sister raised my niece, Megan who lives right here in Charleston right now, is a single mother from the time my niece was three years old. Her father walked out. In the absence of a man in her life, I called her for school every day, from elementary through high school. And she said, I want to be the first doctor in the family. Aunt Jennifer is the first lawyer. I want to be the first doctor. So I woke her up for school every morning, and I said, good morning, Dr. Peeps. <laughs> what was I doing? Fighting the seed in the spirit of the child. I bought her a plastic stethoscope when she was eight years old for Christmas. Three years ago, my niece graduated in the top 10% of her class right here in Charleston at MUSC. She is the first doctor in our family specializing in internal medicine. Mm -hmm. Every generation has a lot of Got to teach our children to believe. They have to see what they want to believe in. You saw the slide. The only thing worse than being blind is having vision, yeah, having sight, sight but no vision. We have to teach them to see what they believe in. We have to teach them principles. We have to sit down with our children at dinner every now and then. We have to go to PTA meetings every now and then. We have to go meet with teachers every now and then. You know why? Because you can't withdraw what you didn't deposit. That's right. Jack? That's right. You cannot withdraw what you didn't deposit. I tell teachers all the time, in the essence, the analogy of money, I was in Detroit last week. These are two $20 bills. I used dollars in Detroit last week. In my left hand is a $20 bill valued in South Carolina $20. In my right hand is a $20 bill in the state of South Carolina valued at $20. I'm going to change the physical structure of this $20 bill. And this is what I do to teachers all over the world. And I crumple it up. And I throw it on the floor. Mm. And I step on it. Mm. And I ask them, what is its value now? They say $20. And I said, oh, is it? Then why do you treat children who look like this different from children who look like this? There, there needs to be a call to action.
See, educators are talking about the wrong stuff. Conjugating verbs, differentiating instruction, curriculum mapping, when they ought to be talking about, do you love children? Because we've got some teachers in America teaching our children that don't even like children anymore. biological children that live at home with them. We gotta get to a point where we realize that 12.2% of America's public school teachers are on some form of medication. We gotta realize that some teachers are not as healthy as you think they are. Which brings me to the point in conclusion that you ought to make sure that your child is with the right person. You can't just drop them off in September and pick them up in May. You can't just say, ooh, they gone for I'd be glad when summer's over. You need to make sure that they're reading books. You need to make sure that they're visiting museums. You need to make sure that you're exposing them to the right thing. And you need to ensure that when the school year convenes, that they are in the right place with the right person. Jeff? Jeff. I want to close out this morning. Brother, I got to close this morning. I, I want to close this morning by telling you that there is no textbook act. Jack, if I had that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in LA somewhere on the beach. There is no textbook act. One size does not fit all. Yesterday, Goose Creek High School, I, I shared with the high school teachers that when you see your class, you realize that everybody is a different height, that everybody is a different weight, that everybody is a different color, mm -hmm. and that you have different socioeconomic backgrounds. The same holds true in how those different sizes learn. So one size does not fit all. You need to be empowered and educated as to what your child's learning style is and how I wish I had time today. But you got the number. Make sure when they call, they don't say to my wife, well, we don't have no money because I'm not coming. Yeah? <laughs> Y'all pay Harry Wong. Y'all pay Ruby Payne. You need to pay Stephen Peter. Yeah? <laughs> There is no textbook answer. One size doesn't fit all. So we got to realize that this is one of the answers. When they matriculate high school and go to college and graduate, there's a future waiting. Jeff, there's a future waiting. They don't have to worry about being interviewed. They can go to job interviews and interview the employer and say, let me get back to you. Jack, my niece in New York City has two master's degrees, 28 years old. Just went on three job interviews, called me and said, um, um, I need some, some help, I need some assistance, I need some guidance. I said, baby, why are you stressed? All three of them want you. Put it to prayer. Ask God where he wants you to be. Jack, because we got to get to a point where we realize that we were not born with the capacity to deal with life on life's terms on our own. God made us in his image dependent upon him. So as we look at this, we got to realize that not only can our children believe, we have to make sure that people are teaching and they are reaching. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you.